thank you, Matt, and thank you, choir, and uh, how true that is. We are never alone, and that's one of the great truths the Scriptures present to us and that we never want to forget. He said He would never leave us. 365 times in the Bible, 365, same as the number of days on the calendar year, 365 times in the Bible, in one way or the other. God tells his people, do not be afraid. I am with you. And with that, I'll ask you to take your scripture reading out of the bulletin, please. And we're going to 1 Peter. And if you'd stand, please, we'll read together from 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, and then verse 7. But we'll be looking at verses 1 through 6 today, and then verse 7 next week. Let's read God's Word together. Wives, likewise, be submissive to your own husbands, that even if some do not obey the Word, they, without a word, may be won by the conduct of their wives, when they observe your chaste conduct accompanied by fear. Husbands, likewise, Dwell with them with understanding, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers may not be hindered. Thank you. You may be seated, and may God add his blessing to the reading of his own holy word. His name is Slats Grobnik a name that would be unfamiliar around these Germanic areas of Hartville and Alliance and Louisville, where so many of us have German or Irish surnames such as Miller or Slabaugh or Cochran or something like that. But Slabs Grobnik is an Eastern European immigrant to Chicago. He immigrated as a child, and as a child, he learned the value of work, hard work. Today, or at least in recent days, he operated what had become the largest Christmas tree sales area in Chicago. And people from the city of Chicago who live in that large and rather unglamorous city, as far as I'm concerned, it's unglamorous, frequently visit the Christmas tree sales area run by Slabs, uh, Slats Grobnik. This story comes from the Grobnik Christmas tree area. One evening, about a week before Christmas, or maybe just a few days less, a young couple came in and were shopping for a tree. After looking for a while, they went to Slats Grobnik, the owner, and they said, we just got married and we really don't have a lot of money to spend on a tree. Where are your <laughs> discounted trees? And he sent them to the back of the lot where the trees that were mangled or that badly needed water or had some deformity were found. These were the trees that normally would be disposed of following the Christmas tree sales season. And there they found two trees. Both the trees were green and their branches looked rather healthy on one side, but they were brown and dead and the needles had all fallen off on the other side. So they took the two trees, which obviously were going to be disposed of very soon, and they asked Mr. Grobnik, how much is one of these trees? Three dollars. Would you sell both of them to us for three dollars? Well, yeah, I will, because really I was just going to throw them away anyway. So they bought the two trees for 
And as they were getting ready to leave, they said, we want to thank you for being generous to us. How about coming by in a day or two and having tea? And we'll show you our Christmas tree. And he said, okay, <laughs> laughing to himself and thinking there is no way that these two, <laughs> there is no way they're going to have a good-looking tree. A couple of days later, having gotten their apartment address, he made his way down the sidewalk to their apartment, and there in the window of this apartment, he saw one of the most beautiful trees he'd ever seen for Christmas, decorated exquisitely. It was gorgeous. And he thought, well, that's not the people I'm looking for. He went in, and sure enough, that was their apartment. He went in and he said, how did you, where did you buy such a magnificent tree? That's not the tree I sold you. And they said, no, it's not. It's both the trees you sold us. You see, when we got home, we whacked off the half of the tree that was dry and dead and we put them together and we bound them together and because they're bound together both sides are alive and we decorated it and Slat Skrobnik was amazed that the two ha trees that were mangled and deformed had come together to form a magnificent and beautiful singular Christmas tree when we look at 1 Peter chapter 3 and other passages in the Bible that relate to marriage, I keep in mind that story from Slat Skrobnik. The Bible makes it clear that all of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God, and in that broad and general statement falls all of the deformities, all of the indiscretions, all of the misdeeds that we have done. And yet when we come together, God would have us to form a beautiful union of husband and of wife. And so we find instructions in God's word that help us to understand just what we need to do to form that beautiful union. The two deformed and half-dead trees brought together were beautiful. And the lives of a man and of a woman with all of the weaknesses and sin and so on brought together can be a beautiful thing called marriage. In 1 Peter chapter 3, we find both the divine duty and the personal responsibility that we have as husbands and as wives. All of us, I'm sure, and especially if you're a woman or a girl in the service today, have been introduced to the fairy tales. The concept of Cinderella or of Sleeping Beauty, who are alone and in Cinderella's case, abused and mistreated, and in Sleeping Beauty's case, lonely. Until Prince Charming enters our lives. And then Prince Charming and Cinderella, or Sleeping Beauty, become married. And how do the fairy tales always end? They lived happily ever after. That's what makes it a fairy tale. <clears throat> so we can live happily, but I'm not sure about the ever after part. Just like the choir sang, he's the God of the hills and the valleys. And there are hills and there are valleys. And the Bible knows that and so addresses that. Well, this is what we would like to think, that life and marriage is a fairy tale, but it is not. And many of us are willing to listen to advice on marriage prior to the wedding, but very reluctant, if not resistant, 
to listening to what God has to say in the way of advice after the wedding. Dr. Willard Harley. Willard Harley is a psychologist who has spent his entire life studying marriage. And you will notice that he has authored many books, and you'll notice the titles of those books, Fall in Love, Stay in Love, Effective Marriage Counseling, Draw Close, it's a book on marriage, He Wins, She Wins. He based that on I'm okay, you're okay. Some of you can remember that book from a few years back. It was a book on personality differences. It basically said, I'm okay, you're okay, basically says no two people are alike, so, you know, accept it. Their personality is okay, and so is yours. You just have to recognize people are different. But that's the idea. He wins, she wins. Surviving an affair, ouch. That's hard. Love busters, romantic love and his needs, her needs. From the book in the upper left, his needs, her needs, comes this information from Dr. Willard Harley. A study that he did in his practice of extramarital affairs and how to avoid them says that there are five needs basic needs of women and five basic needs of men. Now, next week, we'll throw this up on the screen when we talk about verse 7, husbands. But here are five needs of women. The need for affection. The need for conversation. The need for honesty and openness. The need for financial support and the need for family commitment. And the five major needs of men, these are the major foundational or fundamental needs, the five major needs of men, sexual fulfillment, recreational companionship, that means you go fishing with them, um, Domestic support, admiration, and just simply a cheering spouse, one who cheers him on. So those are the needs that people have. I want us today to look at verses 1 through 6, and in so doing, I want to begin with verse 6 and go back. Of verse 1, because verse 6 is where Peter concludes his thoughts on the woman's role in marriage. And a very significant thought is presented here in his conclusion, which helps us understand everything that leads to that conclusion. It's sort of the prism through which we understand everything else that has been said. Now, I'm reading from the New King James a Bible, because that's the version I've chosen to use for this series, but some of the other versions use a word that might be better, but let me read it the way it is here. Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters you are if you do good and are not afraid with any fear. Notice the repetition, afraid, fear, afraid. Fear, afraid, fear. So many of us live in fear, but especially does that seem to be true of a lady. My wife actually, Serena, uh, in talking out this passage together, made the point to me, that seems to be the main thought here. And she said, and of course most of you know me as Pastor Joel. At home I'm just Joe. <laughs> she said, Joe, 
that's what women deal with, is fear. We're told from the time we're little, don't go here, don't go there, do this and don't do this. We're afraid. We go back to this passage and wives are afraid their husband is going to make some colossal financial mistake and leave them broke. You know, we, we go down and we see, do not let your adornment be outward. They're, we're afraid that men are going to find some other woman more attractive. We're afraid. And so this idea of fear and of insecurity needs to be addressed, and it can be addressed here in this passage. I do remember several years ago taking a course of instruction on biblical counseling from Larry Crabb. Larry was at that time, and I presume still is, a professor at Colorado Christian University in the psychology department, and Larry Crabb is well-renowned. And Larry did say in this course that I took that in his counseling and in our counseling as pastors, we have to keep this in mind. Most women are looking for security, and most men are looking for significance. And if we keep that in mind, that will help us understand a lot of the dynamic that's going on in counseling. Significance, and now let's go back to our text, security. The need for security, which of course is a result of fear. Verses 1 to 6. I have a very simple outline now. It's three points. I'll give you the three points, and then we'll cover them, and then we'll close the service and have communion, and that'll be that. But verses 1 through 6 of 1 Peter 3 will teach us this, and this is what I call the big idea. There's the big idea I want to get across to the ladies of our church Wives, the key to your husband's heart is your heart. The key to his heart is your heart. Is your heart right with God? Is your heart one to love? Is your heart one that is like Christ's? Verse 1, wives, likewise. Be submissive to your own husband. The word submissive there means show him due respect. The word likewise in that verse takes us back to what has just been shared in chapter 2. And if you were with us last week, many of you were, some of you were not, you know that we dwelled upon verse 24, which is one of the most significant verses in the entire New Testament regarding the work of Jesus on the cross and what it means to us. But the whole passage preceding this chapter 3, verse 1, is that Jesus trusted the heart of the Father. And Jesus was obedient to the will of the Father. And it all comes back to trust, doesn't it? Are you willing to trust the heart of your husband? Are you willing to trust that he cares about you and cares about the family and cares about the future? Some of you are sitting here and saying, no, I don't trust him. Then we need to work that out, right? But Jesus trusted the heart of the Father and the will of the Father. And so this is predicated upon that trust. Likewise, wives, trust the heart of your husband. Trust the will of your husband. And if they are not believers in Jesus, they will be won by the conduct of your wives. They will be amazed that you love them so and that you trust them so. And they will be. 
this is all a matter of respect. So I call it respect your husband. This is based on the word likewise. Jesus subjected himself to the will of the Father and he trusted the heart of the Father and he was willing even to go to the cross, chapter 2, verse 24. You know, and you do know this, in the Garden of Gethsemane, he prayed in his humanity, remove this cup from me. He knew what was coming. If it be your will, remove this cup from me. He knew what was coming. He knew what was in store. He knew the cross would be there. He knew that on the cross he would experience in some divine capacity the judicial judgment of God where all our sins were laid upon him and where he suffered our hell for us. He knew it was coming. And so he prayed. Not my will, but thine be done. But when he clearly understood what the will of God was, he trusted the heart of God. And he demonstrated his love to the Father. Actions speak louder than words. And you're not going to change your husband or win him to Christ by nagging him. You're going to change him by loving him. By loving him with a heart that trusts him and that cares for him and that is willing to follow when he leads. Secondly of all, relate. This passage talks about relating to your husband. Notice verse 3. Do not let your adornment be merely outward, arranging the hair, wearing gold, or putting on fine apparel. Rather, let it be the hidden person of the heart with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. That talks about relating, relating to the husband. Yes, this passage does not necessarily teach us that we are not to look nice and attractive. That's important. I heard a, an evangelist, actually, when I was a, a child. That used to be quite the thing. And some of you are old enough to remember that. We didn't have our video games, and we didn't have smartphones and television. You only had three channels in black and white, and it was rather boring at times, so you'd go to church, and these evangelists could be quite clever and humorous, you know, very entertaining. But I was as a child sitting in the church service once when an evangelist spoke on this, and he said, this doesn't mean that we're not to use makeup or wear jewelry. After all, if a barn needs a coat of paint, go paint it. For some reason, you know, I, remember, I, I don't remember anything else about the sermon. I mean nothing, but I remember that part. I used to come out here and speak and get perilously close to the, you know, the step, and I realized one day if I'd ever trip and fall, no one would remember a thing that I said. Probably not for the rest of my life, but they'd remember that. Oh, yeah, Pastor Joel, I remember him. He's the one that fell off the platform while he was preaching. So we remember those things. But what this passage of Scripture is saying, not that those are wrong, but there is something better. And what is better than makeup, what is better than jewelry, what is better than that stuff is a gentle and quiet spirit that is very precious in the sight of God. The Spirit is all important. The Spirit is all important. The real beauty of a woman is what is within. 
One of the things I tell my granddaughter, she's now six, she has beautiful, long, blonde hair, and I'll run my fingers through her hair, and I'll say, your hair is so pretty, but you know what I like best about you? You're prettier on the inside than you are on the outside. And with that, I'm trying to allow her to know that her spirit, her walk with God, her attitude toward others and toward life is all important. And it is. Recognize that real beauty is within. The physical beauty of the body diminishes, but the spiritual beauty is what should grow and what increases as we know God better and better through life. This is the beauty that does not fade. This is the beauty that is very precious in the sight of God. Thirdly of all, this passage teaches us that we need to respond. We need to focus on how we respond to our husband, verses 5 and 6. For in this manner, in former times, the holy women who trusted in God, do you trust in God? Are you willing to believe that God's word is true? Are you willing to obey him? Here Peter is saying, go back into the Old Testament scriptures. Go back there and read about the holy women of God. What were their lives like? Learn from them. I think that in general, we can toss that out. Learn from all of them. I'm going to present you an example in a moment of Sarah, but you can learn from others. Learn from Ruth. Learn from Esther. Learn from the holy women of the Old Testament. For in this manner, in former times, the holy women who trusted in God also adorned themselves What's he talking about? He's not talking about rouge. He's not talking about jewelry. He's talking about their spirit. This is how they adorned themselves. Being submissive to their own husbands. As Sarah obeyed Abraham calling him Lord, whose daughters you are, if you do good and are not, I'm going to paraphrase, consumed with fear. Because that's what the phrase means. And if you're not consumed, if you're not afraid all the time, afraid of getting old, afraid of losing the kids, My good friend Mike McCartney, who's now with the Lord, used to share with me some of his counseling experiences. And he told me once of a, a couple whose lives, both the husband and the wife, were surrounded uh, on the children and the children's activities. And he told me once, Joel, the day's going to come when the last one of those children leaves the house, and when they do, they're going to end up looking at one another and saying, who are you? I said, well, Mike, do they know this? Do they know that's your assessment? And he said, no, but they're going to find out. They need to spend time together. They need to learn one another. Consumed with fear. Afraid of aging, afraid of losing the kids, afraid of dying. No way to live a life. A quiet and a gentle spirit, loving kindness and caring for others. This is how we respond. 
I want to leave you today, ladies, with a question that I'm going to leave with the men next week, the husbands. And here's the question. If I were my spouse, would I want to be married to me? If I were my spouse, would I want to be married to me? Now, that's interesting, isn't it? Well, would you? If the answer is no, then today's the day to make a change. A change for the better. Respect him, relate to him, respond to him. It used to be, historically, uh, women have always worn a ring when they've gotten married. That's true of men today. It's not always been true of men. But historically, women have always worn rings. They've found uh, skeletons and archaeological digs of women in Egypt and in Asia, uh, usually in a very arid climate. The body is better preserved in arid areas, that is, dry and hot areas. And they find these, these women, these princesses usually, uh, with a ring. But it used to be they'd wear the ring on the index finger. That's why a moment ago I had my <laughs> index finger up. No, I wasn't just holding it up. One, yeah, I can count. See, one. But they used to wear that ring on the index finger. And then in the 400s, sometime in the 5th century, some doctors came out with their latest information that said there is a direct vein that runs from the heart to the third finger. of the right hand. Runs right up there into the, or of the left hand, I'm sorry. It runs right up there into the heart. And so they moved uh, tradition from the index finger to the third finger. Because that vein, the vein of love, they called it, the vein of love. And so the third finger became the finger for the ring. Because of the so-called vein of love. I don't know if there is a literal vein that runs from the heart to the third finger or not. I really don't, but I do know this. There needs to be a vein of love in our relationship as husband and wife, and there needs to be a vein of love in our homes. We look at this passage and we realize and we as husbands and men will realize next week, there's always more we can do. So let's do it. And let's glorify God by doing it. And let's get the most out of our relationships in marriage. Shall we pray? And as we go to prayer this morning, our deacons and their wives are going to be standing. And if you're here today and there's a need in your life and you request the prayers of the church or you're here and you're not a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ and you'd like to be or you just have questions about the church or about life following our benediction please see one of these men or women or a couple and have your questions answered our deacons have prepared the communion table, and we will be taking a break for about eight minutes. We've learned that that's just about right. And if you have a child or a group of children over in the education area, go get your child and bring him or her back. And we know children are children. We have the scribble pads in the pew racks for the children. Let them scribble if they're too young to understand but plan to stay and observe the Lord's table with us. If you have to go, we wish you God's best. And between now and next Sunday, invite someone to church with you because they will appreciate being asked. Dear Father, today we have looked at this passage from 1 Peter 3, which emphasizes to us the importance of the husband and wife relationship. May we not take our marriage for granted. May we love one another, serve one another, and may we 
continue to grow in love for one another until Jesus comes back. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, may the love of God the Father, and may the communion of the Holy Spirit rest and abide upon us all till our Savior come and evermore. Amen. God bless you all. You are dismissed.